Hi, my name is Vida Madigiogu. I am a Nigerian artist and writer based in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, my practice is mostly sculptural based, but I also mix with mixed media often. Just a bit of context for my background. Um, I'm Nigerian born, but I moved to Luanda when I was about five, visited between Nigeria and Luanda for almost 10 years, then moved to Cape Town at about 13, a bit under 13, where I am still at the moment completing my final year at study at the University of Cape Town's Art School, Michaelis. Um, all of that is to say that I approach things with the privilege of having a very international rounded background um, and having seen different people at different spaces. So that's just to give a little bit of insight into the discussion that I'll be having. I'll also be basing most things off of my own experience, both as artist and student within this space, but also having completed most of my academic career in Cape Town. Um, I'm hoping to stay on topic while keeping casual enough to hopefully encourage discussion, but I'm a well-known pantser, so that could happen. My topic will be discussed, or my discussion will be mostly framed around decoloniality. Um, I'm thinking about it through the idea of creativity always coming through the work. Um, but as the title says, I'm looking at thoughts and revolutions through creativity in African cities, and all of that is under the umbrella frame of decolonial study and practices. Um, I think urgency, creativity, and agency wind up roping in quite nicely with this discussion, especially when you're looking at us living in a post-colonial world. Um, so yes, um, when it comes to, just as a overview of decoloniality, when it comes to decoloniality, I always tend to struggle and wrestle with trying to have a fixed definition or understanding of it. And I think that comes from the fact that the colonial matrix of power that being the very environment that cultured Western domination over a greater number of people's knowledge system, lands and freedom is not only still thriving decades after colonists have left and the many acts of acts against humanity have been abolished, but this same colonial matrix of power claims sovereignty over what and how something can be implemented and defined. Often this is also the case with defining, framing and learning decolonial theories. Um, during isolation, a whole, if not many, many lifetimes ago, my understanding of university for the first time in my very short tertiary educational career shifted. The highly respected Institute of Learning was no longer a name to use for networking strategies. It wasn't the centuries worn walls, uh, the legacies of several old white men whose names and grandiose stories I never paid much attention to outside of the Feast Must Fall protests that shook the country, South Africa, reckoning with the notion of privilege and the rights to education. For the first time, university became mine to govern. The curriculum remained the same and the lecture still happened. Like every good student, I attended all of my Zoom lectures, <laughs> an absolute lie. Um, but the mechanisms of learning offered just enough distance from the rigid space of the lecture halls and the auditoriums that still echoed with Eurocentric sovereignty. This distance brought about a flexibility that allowed knowledge and ideas to become tangible. Because of the privilege I have with a personal computer, having a room by myself where I can learn and almost uninterrupted Wi-Fi, I had access and ability to be able to stop time, essentially. When lectures became slushed words that seemed to pass through me, I could pause and find videos, writings, scholar works, academic and non-academic that better explore these topics. I could skip over lectures, biases. I could pluck out the themes and topics they gave to me and rather search the world for solutions to these topics that make more sense. I learned how to make peace with opposing views and arguments because I could still expand university's borders to spaces that grappled with these themes and topics based off of their own historical context and history, historical relationships with colonization. I was able to come to an understanding that decoloniality and discussions on decoloniality need room to breathe, to be flexible enough, to stretch wide enough to host the many, many approaches and experiences of the many indigenous displaced diasporic black and brown bodies whose individual perspectives offer different angles that allow us to chip away at the marble stone of Western sovereignty. 
Just on the side, I've included um, just quick names of some of the theories or theorists that I've referenced in my research on decoloniality. Most of it comes from the writer and, um, sorry, most of which comes from writer Walter Mignolo and his theory on decoloniality and delinking. I was able to digest this at my own pace. And just to highlight some of his critical ideas, part of the practice of decolonization is to be in the constant position and constant poise of critiquing, reassessing, unlearning, and recentering our sources, academic and creative sources. This is a tracing back and a questioning of our individual understandings of critical thinking, the beginning acts of separating from Western colonial thinking. Otherwise summed up to the act of delinking and relinking. Mignolo, along with many decolonial thinkers, pushed that key ingredients to decolonization is precisely interrogating, problematizing, destabilizing, and ultimately transforming the colonial matrix of power. I understood this separation as an urgent but a personal severance. Part of the practice is the acceptance that there are many, many ways to approach decoloniality. When it comes to delinking and relinking, I like to think of these as tools for revolution. They are an option for placement of power and the rebuilding of knowledge bridges. They become the building blocks for Afrocentric praxis. Delinking is the separating, relinking is the filling in of the gaps made by the separations. And with new and old Afrocentric tools, led ideas and, act, and create acts of decolonial disobedience. This concept of decolonial disobedience is coined by Chicana theorist Lauren Perez and explored in the writings of Mariana Ortega. It is disobedience based on knowing oneself. By reallocating focus internally, cultivating and meditating on self-image within the borders of nations and cities, such as partaking in a festival designed to create room for discussion on creativity and sustainability in African cities, at least different, they live very little attention and room for the Western other. Again, paraphrasing Mignolo, the nature of disobedience is dependent on the individual and varies in approach ranging from civil to violent, but ultimately it's focused on a return to power to the people. Creative approaches to decolonial, decolonial disobedience for me involves taking pleasure in identity, separating, which is separate from national pride. This is the enjoyment derived from activities that are linked directly to cultural identity. It ranges from dance to song and food. A big shout out to all the chefs, food bloggers, and individuals promoting joy and diversity and flavor. It's the reveling and the colorful, vibrant, and loud spirits of our cities. This enjoyment doesn't have to be great stands or purpose-driven tasks for them to be significant, for them to be disobedience and therefore decolonial. These can be moments of breath and be moments of fun and enjoyment. Creative, decolon creative colonial disobedience can even be the act of relearning languages, stories, and songs. It highlights the responsibility of representation and what we do with these. Um, all of this is to show how creativity can become both pen and sword. It can become tool used for decoloniality and it can transform spaces that we would not have ordinarily thought of being transformed the way that they move through them. Creativity offers solutions for preserving cultural identities and lead to more sustainable possibilities for urban and political issues in African cities. Creativity offers solutions for creating safe spaces where the power, where power of epistemology, which is the act of creating knowledge systems and knowledge making, aligns with Afrocentrism, like in this Venn diagram over here. Um, Afrocentrism is, in, from my opinion and my viewpoint, an Africa first approach where morality, philosophy, and culture of the individual or collective African cities is taken into account. This is recentered at the core of the idea making and it's from there that new ideas come and flow through when reckoning and moving through ideas of decoloniality. One of my absolute favorite examples for this is the, please forgive my pronunciation, the Heiskum Voice project. Um, this project was held in, this project focused on the District 6 area and District 6, 
District 6 former residents. It just as a brief overview of what had happened, District 6 was an area that inhabited, that was mostly inhabited by the colored and Cape Malay community in Cape Town who were forcibly removed. Families, communities, individuals were uprooted from their lives due to apartheid segregation and housing laws. These people still have yet to be returned to their homes and reconnected with their communities. The project sought to run workshops and on making textiles and exchanging of stories between members in the community. It also wanted up making this absolutely incredible recipe book where they were really pushing the idea of memory, of memory through food and the importance of memory in all of this reclaiming and de reclaiming and remembering um, acts of decoloniality. It allowed people to share their stories and share their favorite foods that had been wafting smells through streets around their environment and their community long before the forced removal. Here it shows the memory of power, memory of the power of remembering, and it also helps equip and re-equip individual members of community alongside the creative ones. So here's a bit more information on that. Um, I just realized that I might have been rushing <laughs> because I'm wrap not necessarily wrapping up, but I'm coming to um, the climax of decolonial theory being decolonial woes, which was illustrated, in, which was a topic illustrated by Mariana Ortega, which shows the burden of creativity and urgency. This is something that follows all of us as African creatives, both those who decide to be quite radical with our creativity, but even just those existing as creatives within African cities. Um, decolonial woes can be summed up or explained as the ache experience in spaces where there are scholars and creatives from indigenous, diasporic, black and brown backgrounds speaking in this context on decoloniality and creativity, but that their works very rarely get pushed into mainstream. This is mostly due to institutional and systemic issues. It's something that is sure has been experienced by several people within this space. You make something that offers solutions to problems experienced by your community, but it gets washed out, diluted, or cast aside due to institutional biases. Here is where support from youth allies come in. Beyond equipping young creatives, which is also extremely important, those who have access to definitely should be pushing forward to equipping from education-wise to even providing the tools and learning agents. Um, but beyond that form of equipment, it is also the act of championing these young individual projects. It is learning more, listening more, um, engaging with them and creating platforms that allow sharing and exchange. It's giving room to share and exchange while also giving room to explore and experiment with old and new tools. It allows young creatives to play around more with theories and practices and develop their own ideas around the world of creativity and the world around them living again in a post-colonial world. Um, so this brings me to probably my absolute favorite part, <laughs> which is just looking or talking through um, creative practices. Um, my absolute favorite element of it is because I'm a visual artist as much as other than when speaking, I enjoy playing with words. I also enjoy playing with visuals. I wish I could have included music into this, but unfortunately I would be too embarrassed to share my music interest. And it's not to say it's not got a lot, it doesn't have a lot of African artists. It is just, I'm not sure how they'll be received. <laughs> um, but instead what I've offered is two of probably my favorite creatives at the moment who are really pushing ideas behind agency and urgency today. Um, the first being Tebe Magugu, who is a young South African designer based, I believe, in Joburg, making the most insane fabrics and stories. His practice is based in telling stories about South African history and heritage and culture through the clothes and through the fabrics that he's displaying. He really has quite a fine eye for the detail of the designs and the details of 
the models who's were, who are wearing them, but then even more so the stories of the people who he's telling. He approaches it through color and using vibrancy and almost celebrating these stories, putting them in a on a platform, for lack of a better word. Um, one of my favorite or the exhibition or, or rather fashion show that um, I'd be talking about is the spring summer 2020 counterintelligence line. This was a line with 14 looks and three menswear um, that was discussing the stories of defective apartheid spies. So these were double agents that originally were working for the apartheid government and then defected to helping the ANC. Um, they all of which play key roles in destabilizing apartheid. Magugu was interested in what makes someone commit treason. And in this case, treason is something that we're celebrating because it is something that ushered in liberation and freedom for a great number of people. Um, Magugu goes on to say that our immediate picture of spies is largely informed by their portrayal in popular culture, slim, ostentatiously demure, fashionable and aloof. Truth is, spies are all around us. They are our beloved teachers, friends, and family members, one of which being um, Olivia Anne Marie Forsyth. She was a British born agent who was brought in from the UK into Rhodes University. There she was supposed to be spying on the ANC only to defect. This polka dot dress is actually made up of her fingerprints, which she volunteered up and the tailoring and the use of the design in this not only pushes her story forward, and I also have to add in here, it's quite interesting seeing something so personal and private, especially for a spy being blatantly out there, repeated over and over again. So repetition becomes a, a tool that he uses while also playing on the idea of the seen and the unseen of the, loud and the violent acts of decoloniality. The second and last artist I'll be talking about, I think um, acts very well as a bridge between our two countries because there's a lot of beef between Nigerians and Ghanaians when it comes to ownership of things, specifically jollof rice, but I'm not gonna go into that. <laughs> um, Ella Natsui. Ella Natsui is an incredible Ghanaian born and proud artist. He is a sculptor who's studio is in Nigeria. Um, he works out of Enugu, a university town as well, and he winds up employing a lot of the local youths within the space because the sculptures that he winds up creating are insanely breathtakingly large. Um, his work focuses on sustainability at its very, very core. Using recycled liquor caps, he creates these large-scale tapestries that are sewn together also by aluminum wire, negotiating Nigeria's colonial history while also working on how do you work with the community while portraying work about the community. This is just some zoom up shots or bigger shots of some of his work. His work is actually currently at exhi on exhibition in Cape Town, which is very exciting because I've always wanted to see his things in real life. Um, this piece stretches in, what is that, four meters, <laughs> four meters by five meters. And it is entirely made up of bottle caps. Again, sewn with these metal wires, he has to wind up teaching each individual assistant that comes into his workshop, but then have them running in almost um, work workshop warehouse-like lines where they're sorting, arranging, welding, hitting, combining these materials together. So it becomes an act of collaboration. It becomes an act of historical remembering um, yeah, this is another zoom up of his work, just so you can see the details that go into the cutting, the binding, the sewing and, sewing and stitching of these pieces. So in summary slash end notes, um, most of or everything that I've said kind of links back to the ideas of delinking and reclaiming. Um, Delinking isn't necessarily to say completely forget everything. It is more of an introspective look into what is there that needs to be revised, what is there that has been contaminated or tainted 
by the environment around us. I mean, even the way I approach research is something that I'm still like trying to reckon with because I still approach it with a very Eurocentric tertiary educational way from how I portray and discuss these topics. And the act of reclaiming is filling in these spaces and revising these spaces and having something to go back to when you're looking at how do I look at morality and philosophy and these ideas again, but using an Afrocentric approach. Um, sustainability and preservation. Sustainability here is being used as sustainability of, these, of the cultures involved. Um, yes, sustainability in terms of environmental issues, um, but then also in preserving cultural heritage from recipe books and workshops led by individuals to communities that have been displaced to gathering people around to work on their own, to work on and teaching them on um, craft and art making, epistemology and learning through revising how we approach knowledge making goes through all of it from creativity to even how you approach being a student in these institutional spaces. Like I said, I'm still working on revising and re delinking and reclaiming um, ways of Afrocentric epistemology. Um, and then finally, collaboration. Collaboration both internationally amongst other African cities and countries seems to be the core theme, but then also collaboration with communities at home in our backyards beside us and all around us. If there's nothing else that was gained from this, one thing that I can say is to be a creative in an African city, be it Accra, Kumasi, Portakot, Lagos, Luanda, Cape Town, it's critical it gets very messy and it is extremely uncomfortable, but it should also bring joy because we are quite literally at the forefront of changing and potentially revising how we approach decoloniality for a more sustainable approach to decoloniality. Just to look through, um, here are some other references that I used during my research um, in case anything struck or anything wanted to be looked a bit deeper in and because I was worried about time. I didn't go through all of the arts I wanted to mention, but here's a short list of some of my favorite African artists that I think embody themes of urgency, creativity, um, agency, and decoloniality. Um, so all those are, I think, worth the look. Thank you.